Okay, uh, let me get the link first. I know I posted it in... There we go, copy link location, and I will post that to the chat now. But by way of introduction, uh, Will is a um, LUG member from afar. Uh, started can, out here. And, yeah, I, uh, I started uh, out there. And, uh, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I started out when I was a college student at Iowa State. You guys got me really kind of moved along the way. Um, and I can say uh, thank you so much because it's amazing how I went to school and it's the LUG that kind of shaped my career more than school did so awesome <laughs> i've often found that it's uh, not necessarily what you know it's who you know that uh, helps quite a bit sometimes uh, i can see that all right it at least gets your foot in the door i didn't know anyone when i came out of school or no one that mattered apparently like chris said it's not necessarily the formal learning it's yeah <laughs> the outside learning too all right Let's see if I got that. Okay, and it's closed. All right. So uh, Terraform, um, I posted the link so you guys can all follow along with the presentation locally so you don't have to like stare at my screen, hop along, whatever. Um, so like Andrew said, my name's, I'm Will Christensen. I'm Dago Red on the IRC channel. And uh, I gave you guys a Kubernetes talk before. And uh, by the way, thank you uh, for kind of putting me on the spot for Terraform because as much as it's useful, um, I found out there's some coworkers I need to give this talk to. And uh, well, this talk is going to be reused in the company so I can train other people. Uh, and also I, I apologize too if it's not the most polished because I literally finished it like 20 minutes before the meeting started. So anyway, so what's Terraform? Uh, by the way, is this window over here in the can you guys see my Zoom window in the in the way, or do you guys see my entire screen? No. I I see the slide. Okay, good. You don't. Okay, so you don't see the stuff in the corner. Good. All right. Um. <clears throat> so, uh, Terraform. Um. What is it? It's the infrastructure as code um language. It's a declarative language owned by HashiCorp. And uh, people just apparently love it. It's uh, written primarily in Go. So it's designed to be as fast as possible. It can be extended with custom code. However, <clears throat> like Ansible, if you've got a lot of experience with it, there's a lot of built-in modules. The need for anything in, uh, to, to extend with any custom code is uh, pretty much handled for 90% of what you're ever going to touch it for. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> As I mentioned, all major uh, for, oh, was it, uh, major cloud providers use it, say the virtual private uh, uh, servers. Um, so if you have your uh, Linode, your, um, what is it? If you have Linode, you have uh, DigitalOcean, you have, uh, you know, Rackspace, all of that will be take completely covered uh, with uh, the default providers in Terraform. Um, <clears throat> so, one thing I need to definitely make sure that everyone knows about is that Terraform is strictly for provisioning. Um, they talk about it trying to be more of a programming language than it is easily usable, but it's still a possibility to do like, you know, some type of system programming if you wish. Um, it's, 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 a, it's mostly a one trick pony and it does that one trick quite well, but uh, don't try to think it's going to be the be all end all of everything uh, <clears throat> of uh, um, someone from plug was wishing me luck in my talk today. Cool. Um, it's not supposed to be like the be all end all programming language that can solve all your problems. So don't treat it like a Python or anything. Um, <clears throat> you can do some things that Python isn't as good at, which is doing like setting up outputs very easily from your pro provisioned uh, sources. Um, the other thing too is uh, Terraform checks the state. So if you go to run the same script over and over again, it will go, hey, this is underneath management. Do you want to blow that out? You know, and it's just, and if it matches up enough, it's not going to even make any changes as long as your code for where you've run it is not different than where the source is. And we'll do that a little bit in the, dem uh, in the demo. Um, what else? Uh, oh, and to use, it's stupid simple. It, it, if you download code off the internet to run it, you do the same four steps from 
start to finish with everything. It's it's quite wonderful. Um, well, even though they do, uh, and because and with the help of third party support, they do have VMware support um, with third party modules and KVM locally. So everything I'm doing uh, is possible to use a uh, a local third party provider. However, because of how it's done, is uh, those are all written in Go, so you have to set up everything for compiling custom Go packages lo uh, locally, and they are not the same quality as some of the other uh, like you know, provider modules, let's say like in Amazon or AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. Um, but they're enough that I've managed to deploy an Ubuntu system. Problem is, is I didn't know what I was doing at the time because it was my very first touch of Terraform at the time. And I couldn't even set the password. And I'm not sure if there's any Ubuntu users here. Try to look up online how to log into an Ubuntu system that didn't use the installation disk and ask what the default user password is or the default root password is. The answers you will get are maddening and comical because clearly no one's ever thought to install Ubuntu via Terraform on a local system in KVM before. So try that. And that's about, oh, and then a native INAM. So if you have a login system, all everything that Azure, Google Cloud, or AWS used for, um, uh, was it for security for logging in? Just like the command line, it uses the same type of security. So you don't have to do anything special. Uh, you don't even have to uh, exercise um, any special credentials you would store in like any files that are any different in Terraform, it's all there. And also most importantly, uh, Terraform is owned by HashiCorp. HashiCorp did start out I believe mostly as a way of handling secrets management. So if you need to store secrets uh, and provision, this tool is phenomenal. All right, so that's what Terraform mostly does right. What it doesn't do is like, as I kind of hinted at, is pretty much anything outside of provisioning. Yeah, it like if it's in the AWS catalog, it's going to have a Terraform module to it. If you need to connect to the said uh, uh, resource and do anything custom with it, like let's say you deployed a system and let's say you did some changes, but you want to do some type of configuration management, something like a Puppet or Ansible would do for controlling it. Terraform is not your friend here. Don't even try. But if it's something where you get lost in the interface for clicking around, Terraform scripts are surprisingly really easy to write, and I find it easier to navigate than the AWS GUI or Google Cloud GUI. Um, you will see general programming on how to do it online. You will also look to see how wanky it is, and it to me, as someone who's not a fan of Ruby, um, I would actually rather do anything in Ruby than anything that would be deterministic with uh, Terraform in terms of programming, in terms of like string manipulation. So just putting that as a kind of a staple there. All right, so um, I'm gonna be shooting, or I'm gonna be using some terms. Uh, I wanna make sure everyone's on board. Uh, we're gonna skip the first four or five because you, we're going into depth later. But when you go to write the scripts in Terraform, uh, imagine, you have each the resource, the data uh, resource, or sorry, data module, variable, and output. They're just nothing more than glorified calls of JavaScript, uh, or sorry, JSON objects. But unlike JSON, they're tweaked a little bit, and most importantly, and as a benefit, you don't need to worry about the comma at the end of every line of Terraform like you do with JSON. So, but we'll get into a little bit of code later on and showing off, you know, what's data and that kind of stuff. Um, state file, something that you will look at if you want. Um, it is a JSON uh, file that goes whenever you go to do like a Terraform plan, whenever you want to go to try to like, you know, publish a resource, that state file will get updated, which obviously will update the state of the resource as far as Terraform knows it. Um, Terraform is all about syncing a whatever provider modules there to try to make it all happy. Um, it's really nothing more than just a fancy way of saying, here's an AWS console. Oh, look, there's a, a private server already provisioned with this name. 
it'll up to, it'll let you warn you in the state file. You can get it under control with Terraform then, do whatever you want, but you can watch that state file for whatever you need. Also, with the Terraform import, you can watch that state file and go from barely knowing anything about Terraform to making uh, something that you created in the GUI by looking at that state file. So, key, uh, uh, was it, uh, key thing to uh, put there. Um, variables. Uh, when I say variables, it is literally a keyword that is written out for a specially formed JavaScript like ter hashy, what is it, syntax for variables used to use across whatever modules you want. Um, there is a certain way and we can go into like what a best practice would be uh, briefly. And there's a code repository for everyone to play with at the very end of the slides that we can, or that I'll be showing everyone, as well as just a brief demo of what does a module look like and how messy it can get and some little tricks there. Um, now, then also versions. Versions is something that in version 12 or 0 0.12 and up, you need to have a versions file, which will also have uh, links for any type of third party modules that you need to download. Um, any type of, you know, what version of Terraform are you using? This is just something that has been kind of like ad hoc slapped on at the end. And Terraform will help write that original file for you as long as it's pretty basic, um, just to make sure, just to get you going for 0 0.13 and moving forward. All right. so. Terraform, even if you are just grabbing code off the internet and running it, this is the most important part you need to care about, using it. Um, on the uh, left are the four steps. You'll see it highlighted for which one's going to be the one that we're actually talking about and what's going on with it. But uh, so just high level overview and literally if you wanted to grab, as long as you have the variables set up for what you're trying to do, you should be able to do, find a Git repository that has um, Terraform. There's a lot of them for AWS, Google's, um, for Google Cloud, almost all their resources and things that you want to do, they have something on GitHub, which is just amazing to use and well documented, or sorry, sorry, hiccup, uh, well documented, just can't praise it enough. And uh, yeah, we'll just go through each step. Um, so first one, Terraform init. So when you go to run Terraform init, it is literally going to say, okay, I'm in this folder. There's a bunch of the files that say .tf or .tf vars in it. I want to run Terraform. And just to get everything set up, if you've never, if you just grabbed it off of GitLab or GitHub and you just want to run it, do Terraform init and it'll get help get you started. Um, before running this command, if this is your first time running the command, make sure that you have your Go path set up first, uh, more that, so than anything else. Um, it, it's just, and when you go to build, you're going to want to have all that, you know, kind of lined up. You do it once, you forget about it. It's, there's, been lots of people writing about it. Pretty much is just set up a folder that says go in your user directory. And uh, there's an alias you put in your dot bash RC and you're off to the races. <clears throat> oh, and source it before you run it the first time, obviously, um, just to make sure it's there in your environment variables. Um, all right, so what it will create is a dot Terraform folder and it will go out and read your resources and make sure that it's all, it's gonna pull in all the resources that it needs to get it ready or it gets it ready to run. Um, this doesn't include third party resources, but it will look in that versions folder. So if you have like something that was written in Go for a third party resource, or you reference something that is a third party resource that needs to be compiled, that's let's say on GitHub, it will actually go out to GitLab or GitHub and it will download and compile during that init stage during that part. Um, It'll also ensure that your source code is up to date and it'll look for that versions file. If it won't, it'll complain and even guide you for how to write that resource file at that time. And most of the time I tend to go through all these steps, run Terraform in it, and then I just find out at the very end, oh crap, Terraform's not installed on this, you know, virtual private server, you know, instance, wherever. So that's where I use this step for me just to remind me, is Terraform running or not? <clears throat> all right, Terraform plan. Literally, the, the command, these commands are, you, you write it out exactly as I written, uh, write them over here. All lowercase, once it's installed, you'll see it. Um, so this one will remind you one last time if your version files uh, is set up properly with anything greater than version uh, 0.12. 
Um, it'll double check your syntax to make sure that every that the syntax is correct. It won't run it, but think of it like Ansible check um, for like testing playbooks. It'll ensure your INAM there's there because it will reach out to the provider and it will try to get kind of like a loose idea of state in uh, of the current state of the uh, uh, of the potential uh, uh, resources that you want to provision. It will verify and compare so you can start seeing a plus minus and that kind of stuff when you go to do it and we'll show that in the demo. Uh, it'll also do one final check to make sure everything is available for when you go to run the apply step and make sure that it's, you know, like all the Go code is uh, present and built. Um, as well as if it's calling up any modules, I'll make sure that the modules are reachable. <clears throat> and uh, for me, I found this is quite possibly the best way to practice Terraform uh, without actually having to spend any a, a dime or a, a penny on any type of cloud provisioning. So if you want to kind of ballpark things how they should be, there you go. I know uh, it, there are ways for GitOps to start using the plan files that come from it, which is the Terraform states, um, for when you do Terraform plan to ensure what the current state is supposed to be. And you can track that information along as you go to apply to see if there's a difference. And then that way you can be notified in your GitOps pipeline um, for provisioning and ensure that the changes are done properly. Uh, I, if you are running this consistently and you're just doing like apply, destroy, apply, destroy, I've skipped this step in the past it, if you're in a rush. All right, so uh, the apply step. It's literally just take code, go go let them do the provider. Um, when you do run the apply though, the most important part is to make sure that when you go to run, hit apply, don't run away to the bathroom right away. Don't don't take a conference call and forget about it. Wait until it goes to talk to the provider for a moment, sets up some things. It's gonna ask you a question. Do you actually wanna do this? If you don't type yes, it won't do it. If you have a very long provisioning and you've got and you're short on patience, I've come back over an hour later going, okay, cool. It's done provisioning, I'm ready to go. Crap, I never typed in yes. Careful here, it will bite you. Um, let's see here. And because literally you can grab code off the internet, do next to nothing, do apply and have a ton of work done, it, it is quite possibly the most rewarding command you will ever run. Destroy. It, it's what it is. If it's underneath management, or if it's not sometimes, it'll go out to your provider, it'll check, and you'll see a bunch of minus signs. It'll say, do you really want to delete this? And you have to type out yes, fully. And it'll actually go and just nuke everything. Um, I haven't tried to see if there's any type of dependency management in like other projects, but it's a, it is a very powerful tool um, so careful. As a developer, it's wonderful. It will probably delete everything. Everything you provision with Terraform, it will remove. The only thing I got bid on so far with destroy that it did not destroy something on Linode was the Kubernetes platform where there were some load balancers that were provisioned. After the fact, uh, I forgot about it. So I had load balancers I was paying for, but no cluster or instances that was linked to. So thanks Linode, but it's there. <clears throat> so modules modules are the biggest mind combobulation I have ever like seen so really you just have a main Terraform here and let's say it has a module call the module call literally is just going to say module the name of what you're using the module that means absolutely nothing I would recommend putting something in the description for it and we'll show the syntax for it but then literally there's one line that after underneath that module and whatever name you want to give it is source. And source is going to be where it's going to go. And literally it's like taking everything that you define in that block of code is going to be matched up to the variables. And then it's just going to run like another variables file someplace else. Um, this is all managed in terms of dependency, what should run first um, by some voodoo that all that's figured out by Terraform for you. So don't worry about it. It's all declarative and it doesn't matter what uh, what uh, 
order you put it in. Um, Terraform is fantastic at just grabbing everything that says resource, variables, whatever, mashing it all together and just hitting the go button and going. If there's any type of order of operations, your uh, it's all handled for you with the provider uh, resources. We'll get the code in just a bit. So Terraform import, like I said, we'll save that for a demo. So we're gonna provision a system poorly in the UI and we were trying to get it under control with the command line and show you how to go from GUI to pretending on how to use Terraform. Um, that's pretty much it for there. And uh, demo, uh, first of all, any questions before we go in the demo? Nope, all right. By the way, I shut off video because I like talking into the void. It's kind of fun that way. Oh, yes, <laughs> oh, yes of course. I, the magical words that my coworkers have learned to be afraid of. So if you click on it, it's a link. It will take you directly to the Clueless Coders page, which is a Discord group that I have. Um, oh, good. And there is a chat. All right. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, if you guys ever want, if you guys want access, just ping me later for the Clueless Coders Discord. It's literally just a little introductory thing. Let's see if I can pull it up. Actually, it's over here. And uh, one of the things I have on there is my Discord bot, which is running on my Kubernetes cluster that I can totally do a talk about again, which is cool. But if you guys have interest, oh, let me make it a little bigger. But let's, for instance, for this, if you guys want it, uh, the biggest feature I have is this bot, which if you guys also want to make it run Slack, just let me know. I can provide the code for you. But let's say IA, let's do Polk County. It'll grab, you know, county statistics for COVID. Or if you just put just the state in there, it'll grab state statistics. And if you really have a question, just type in, help me, Dago. There you go. But anyway. It's all there. Uh, this Discord is tied is tied to activities that we do in the Discord in terms of code and teaching. It's literally we have a PhD in CompSci. We have people from Red Hat in there, you know, uh, uh, CEOs, and a lot of completely clueless students in there. So feel free if you uh, if you guys want to link them. So, all right, shameless plug on that. <clears throat> all right, so uh, for the repository, I already have this uh, pulled locally. <laughs> oh, you mean for the talk, uh, Andrew? Oh, yeah. Well, Pennsylvania's on the naughty list for uh, a lot of states now, so I'm kind of pissed off about it because, yeah. Anyway, politics aside, um, so let's go play with some code. All right. Oh, first things first. Um, showing a little bit of what uh. Go that up, put that back up there. All right, so let's do a little bit of what a module looks like quick because that's the one thing I don't have. Let's do a sample loop module TF, a little bigger. So this would be what it'd be uh, for a module call of what we want to use. Um, the actual modules over there, it's Terraform, uh, sorry, it's a uh, Google load balancer or internal load balancer. This is literally on their site. Um, some people download it and have it in a separate modules folder is what the documentation says, but you can literally just point it. Oh, and uh, this is not exactly correct. Excuse me for a moment. I need to fix that. The answer is git like that. And that will point the module to a git resource. And then the module on the receiving side will look a little bit like this, yeah, we'll go a little smaller. Where this is literally coming uh, from there, this is like in their main module. There, there'll be separate files there, but mostly it's gonna be a variables file and the main file. This is stolen literally from there. Um, data, data is you give it minimal knowledge of what you're looking for. It'll match up that resource and just fill out the rest of the details. So you can call it up down here. For instance, data, Google, computer network, network self-link. The self-link for the actual network has to be uh, some automated generated link. So you can use the humanly recognized name to the whatever auto-generated, holy cow, never gonna tape that out name. It'll drop it right in there. Uh, same thing for the sub-network. And the main reason why I left this down here is because I was using something similar for this at work. Loops, 
in Terraform suck. There will be a simple one that I can show you that we did for deploying um, the uh, Ansible, uh, sorry, for the uh, Kubernetes cluster. But, oh gosh, to try to loop over an object in, um, in uh, Terraform, you literally have to use this for loop syntax and then you have to just reference some random value and it will change, allow that, uh, that object to go into a state that can be called up upon by each value. Otherwise, if you don't do this last part where it says like, you know, backend, whatever variable you give it for this for loop, you just, so you define the variable that you want that's gonna be iterated over, you have to pull out some instance of it and point it someplace else and then it's weird. Um, Your sample loop and the loop is defined down here so it's going through two instances right down here where you know it's got a group description zone up here control w there we go and then so this one's going to have group description zone so anyway um if you guys i'll figure out where to put this but if you guys actually go to get hands-on with uh Zoom, or sorry, not Zoom, uh, hands-on with uh, Terraform. Um, yeah, you're, you're going to want that piece because that literally took me about a week and everyone else wants to use maps and it's disgusting. Anyway, closing up. And let's see here. I don't want to make that. Let's minimize that for now. I want to use this one. So, and I just did a quick test while Andrew was introducing me, so I stalled a little bit. Anyway, so Terraform, uh, let's do, get rid of the dot Terraform. Now in the README, I, uh, I'm not gonna go through all the variables and stuff like that, but the main reason why I have things spread up is that I actually have the Linode key in a separate file so I can show you some of the other variables, but online, or sorry, in the repository, I have just something for you to copy, paste and change all the values to get the variables that you're gonna need for this project. It's really copied over from my bus grade project, so have at it. But eh, we'll do this one here because then I change up enough. No, so I don't have a keyword in here, but I do have a password. So if you guys want to mess with the system, if you're quick enough, go ahead, log in. Just don't make me look too dumb. Don't let it charge me. Um, all this is just stuff you want here and then the variables files in another file. Um, like I said before, Terraform only cares about anything with .tf. It's gonna read it all in and then just have some giant key value store and go from there. But anyway, you can see the syntax for the variable here. This is the minimum uh, required um, setup that I would recommend. And if you don't want default, you can also use the word value and set it. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, if you're, yeah, uh, you would set up value uh, or in type and that kind of stuff if you're using a uh, module, which I would just recommend looking at the Google Cloud modules because they are fantastic. All right, and we will finish up here soon. All right, so let's go in the sample. Sample's gonna be really simple. Um, I'm going to use the variables that I have here. So the Linode uh, variable is in a separate file. And I, I also did everyone a favor. So that if you use my uh, checkout, um, I already have the git ignore to make sure that you don't accidentally save your API key as long as you use the same file name in um, git, because that sucks. <clears throat> All right, and then we have, I have a Linode username here, which is the Linode username you provision. So let's actually go to the Linode console. So you can see also proof that it is working. Are you kidding me? There we go. So you click on Linodes. It's gonna be to create your first Linode. Obviously there's nothing there. There's the username that I have up there. Really basic. So we're gonna go through, we're gonna do a demo. Uh, it's gonna be named Arch Demo. Oh, so a little thing. Okay, so resource, this is a resource. So if you're gonna use a resource in Terraform, you type out resource. You say what type of resource it is, and then you have to give it a variable name. That's it. Then down here, Notice it looks very Java, uh, Java JSON-like. That's also it. These are calling up variables that I have in my variables file. Really simple, nothing major. And I think that syntax has also changed a bit 
and 13, so I might need to edit that where you don't need to do the dollar sign bracket anymore or you can get rid of the quotation marks. Don't quote me on that right now. I will go address that as soon as I can. Um, please note also that whenever you see a bracket like that, it means it's expecting an array. Um, it's just a matter of what variable types are there. Everything can be defined in the Linode instance. Well, let's go look at that quick. So if you type in Terraform Linode instance, it's a built-in provider. So it's going to show up here. All right, so there's Linode docs for the provider. And then the provider, you just click on resources and every vendor has this. So we go to instance. They have an example here to really just pull from. It's stupid simple. Just no keynote down here, we're gonna read the documents. They tell you what's required. And then literally everything else you can ignore while you're learning. So go for the basics, build up from there as you need it. Um, so yeah, we're gonna do, well, we're also gonna add something here because we have tags and we're gonna add this tag as, I believe it's a optional, it's a list. Okay, so list means we're going to do this and we're going to do a Terra test. Oh, uh, also pro tip, if you're in Vim, uh, setting your, um, if it doesn't find your syntax right away, set syntax equal to JSON, it, it'll pretty much work. Uh, or config, depends on how your JSON one is set up. If your JSON one is set up, then it's going to complain and show a bunch of red one, a bunch of, uh, um, commas are, or sorry, uh, yeah, commas are missing. So anyway, really basic, uh, you know, uh, the only thing I'm gonna do here is remote execute. In AWS, they have cloud init scripts, which means after provisioning, run the script locally in the box right afterwards. Remote exec will actually SSH for every command to run. This is just an example of what to do. And down here, you have to put down the connection information. It's literally listed just like this. Handy, that works on every instance, but best practices with AWS is that, uh, is the, with the, yeah, is the cloud init script. So look that up in the uh, instance resource for AWS if you are using that. And then I'm gonna make, give myself a convenience for SSHing in there by using an output, so we can see what that's like. So we're gonna use a data thing, so it's gonna grab the data information, pass the information down here. So it's gonna convert my Linode username, go look it up, and from that Linode username, it's going to find some information and how it's organized in Linode to put it and set up an authorized user on there and associate that key with it. And that's all stuff that's on the actual Linode you know, UI. So enough talking for me, let's go play with fire. So Terraform init. All right, so it's going to create that file. Do it. I'm going to do a Terraform plan now. No whammies, no whammies. Okay, so as you're going to see here, and let's go up a little bit. So as you can see, it's going to say refreshing state. So it's actually going to go talk to the actual um, Linode API and verify if there's something there. If there was already something that, uh, or provision for this, you wouldn't see plus signs, you'd see like plus or minus or like a yellow sign saying like no change. Um, red means delete. And if you're provisioning something that's there that doesn't match up, it will delete the old one when you go do apply and just write new on top of it. So we have a nanode, east, that kind of stuff, all basic here. Um, we can go look at the state file afterwards and I can show you guys how to also pull information to extend easily without checking the documentation for anything further that you might want to do. So we'll do now do an apply. So it's going to go check state. It's going to we'll let you do or see the same thing again, but you have to type in yes. And now it's actually going to go to creating it. Let's see if we can make that a little smaller. Okay. That was too small. So that's going on there. And of course, you can see in the background that it's actually building the instance. Now, the instance will be built, but the uh, before the Terraform will complete. Why? The remote exec will start SSHing in 
to finish up the system. So here we go. So the system's built, it's running now, but you're seeing this information down here. So it's actually trying to SSH and run a bunch of commands for whatever I set up down in that section. And assuming it doesn't fail over, we should be golden. And we're there. Now we can check out the Terraform. Oh, and also note that we have SSH, or sorry, we have the uh, IP address there, which if I want, we're gonna do root at that IP. And I'm gonna use my favorite key, data sage, Linode for that. And I'm on the box. It's named Arch Demo one IP adder just to prove it. Yeah, I definitely don't have a 66 address here. Uptime, less than a minute. So yeah, that's Terraform in a nutshell. Um, uh, completely working. Oh, and then to uh, get rid of the system, runs pretty fast. And uh, a Andrew, I believe this would be ideal for you um, because as a developer who probably doesn't want to touch that much hardware, um, this is the best way to work. And you can clean up your toys afterwards, play with your distro, really dive in, and it will work. So much better than the uh, multi-week uh, lead times to get a VM. This is the whole reason why Terraform is a thing. And as a developer, because people want to complain about expensive cl uh, cloud bills, which I'm not going to deny, developers are notorious for terrible cloud bills. It, runtime of cloud is not that bad, but your engineering firm or your engineers, your cloud bill is a multiple of that, maybe exponential from that. So use a destroyer to clean up afterwards. So now let's go have some fun. So I'm going to take that file and I'm just going to do... I'm gonna move that sample file into backup. So it's no longer here. And I'm gonna move a different file over here. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna copy from backup, import. Oh, put that there. Let me know if I need to make the screen bigger for anyone. Say it over chat um, or voice. Just let me know if, there's, if this is difficult to see. All right, so let's full screen this for now. So this is gonna be really basic. Um, I'm just gonna, I have the very basics in here to just try to figure out what's going on with this instance. Um, and I'm gonna try to get control over it with Terraform, but I'm gonna make it manually. So label, sorry, we're gonna call Arch Demo 1 and I will show you guys how to do that in a moment. Also probably means I need to make a quick little script to show how to import things in case people are interested, because uh, this command can get a little weird. So I wanna go to create Linode. I'm not sure if you guys have ever played with Linode. Everything kind of works about the same. It's just uh, Linode and DigitalOcean are a little bit more friendly for creating instances than AWS. But however, once you get used to doing this stuff, it's really not hard. So I want to click this. By the way, this monthly rate, oh, you can't beat it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Linode and DigitalOcean are significantly cheaper. The reason why they are cheaper, too, is because in AWS, you only pay for running systems. If you have a system and you power it off in Linode and in DigitalOcean, you're paying for it still. So if you don't want the system, you must delete, which means hashtag Terraform. <clears throat> I, I don't really recommend using the GUI because it's just not good. All right, and we're gonna call this Arch Demo. Well, yeah, we got that. Tag, I don't care about the tag. Password. Okay, just so I can log in. I'm assuming I'm gonna do that right. Gonna put the user in there for the SSH key. Cool. Everything's there. And of course, I can add block storage and do a bunch of other things too. And also, I, the main reason why I'm using Linode is because I, I'm a sucker for Arch Linux. There's no other way to do it. All right, cool. So, uh, let's 
so now that I have that in there, oh, I forgot to hit create. I'm a dummy. I don't know why I'd always ask that. Anyway, so it's getting set up here. Also note that it gives me weird IP addresses whenever I do this. I've, I've never seen a 192 as a public IP address until creating only from the command line. If I do it from Terraform, there's never an issue. But uh, all the statistics and stuff will be here. You can add stuff, blah, blah, blah. You can always, Linode always has a way to charge you more money if you want to. Okay, done. So now let's go try to get it underneath Terraform. So we have, so importing it and getting under control of Terraform is weird. What I'm going to do is I have to do the resource dot variable name, which is going to be a test. And then I have to put in the instance ID. So the a couple ways to do that, you can use the API, the command, the console com, uh, command line to grab it. You can look at the, uh, the CSV, or you can be ultra lazy like me and just click on the resource and grab this last number because magically that's what you want. So now we're going to do a Terraform import Linode underscore instance, the variable that I'm trying to get set up there. And let's try this first. I, I, I remember this worked in the past. Oh, hey, that worked. Okay. So things I wasn't expecting to be nice and easy. Oh no, this is error parsing. Okay, so no, it did not work. Never mind. Ah. I uh early victory. Never celebrate early people. All right, so a test and we're going to do um Oh crap, I highlighted that. I gotta copy this again. There we go. Now it should import. Hooray! So how do I actually know it's imported? Well, if I do a Terraform plan, Oh, well, Terraform plan says it wants to change things. So that's where you can see like the pluses, minus, and tildes, and that kind of stuff. But how is it underneath Terraform that we know of? Well, let's go look at the TF state, or Terraform state. Terraform, let's go look at the IP address. There we go. So that's IP address. And as you can see, oh, we have IPv6. Well, well let's go see if we can connect with IPv6 because it's 2020. Might as well just add things. But as you can see, we have the uh, 1559071, 159071, SSH, and let's do root at that dash I. Uh, I got to spell. Yes, right. Okay, cool. And there we have it. We're up and running. So that's all fine and dandy. Let's go delete that. Oh, and let's get rid of that system in Terraform. So we went from not having in Terraform to Terraform managed. So if I do Terraform destroy now, and you got to be patient. I wanted to alt tab over. Yes. So let's just start destroying. We should see this in Linode's go off in a second here. There we go, cleared. And it'll take a couple minutes after that just to verify, but that's it. That is Terraform in a nutshell and how to import. Um, when you go to look at the stuff in the state is where you go to, um, when you go to stuff to work with the, uh, the Terraform state is where you would go to uh, see what values you have and that kind of stuff. But now I'm feeling a little playful and I feel like pushing myself because the demo gods desert our demand blood. So of course I'm going to go off script now, which by the way, uh, at the open source summit, we made a comment about the demo gods uh, um, uh, demanding blood. It was all from you guys uh, chiming in during the, uh, the Kubernetes talk that I did with Jason Plum um, early in the summer early in the pandemic, we'll just say. So thank you. Um, and you guys were the only ones to see a live, or there was the only live demo where it actually had a problem. 
um, where I got a little greedy trying to do bonus content, of course. <clears throat> so we're going to go into config buzz. Config buzz is also available online and or, uh, in uh, gitlab.com slash buzzcrate and all the, the, the config buzzes right in there. But I have Terraform in here. So Terraform is actually going to try to deploy an entire cluster. Let's go take a look. So as you see, we're going to have a bunch of systems. We have two resources here. One of them is going to be for controllers, one's going to be for workers. But I'm looping through the workers, and we're going to show you how that works. I'm going to do two work. No, you know what? We're only going to do one worker right away. So it's going to do one worker, and it's going to be a loop that only does one here, and it's going to deploy two systems total. Same things you've seen, it's just more of what you've already seen. Um, Inline's got more stuff in there, mostly for getting the Kubernetes stuff set up. So let's go have some fun. So as before, I have no idea what's actually going on here. So Terraform init, have I done that? I apparently have now. Terraform plan, let's just make sure nothing blows up in my face. No commas, no whammies. Okay, we're looking good. Terraform apply. By the way, if you do this at home, um, you will have a Kubernetes cluster that you can shut down rather quickly and tends to beat out the other options um, for uh, clusters. And did I do this in screen? No, I screwed up. Okay, so. Uh, no, 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 no. Screen dash, uh, let's do this quick. Screen dash s demo, okay, cd into tf. Terraform, apply. All right, let's see how badly I made a mistake. Oh gosh, it's still booting back there. Yeah, this is bad. This didn't do all the things I wanted to. So let's go what happens. What happens if I run apply again? Is it gonna allow me to? It's gonna try to create. Oh, it complained. So let's do a Terraform. You're not gonna have to destroy it and start over? Apparently I did. Uh, I, uh, I was uh, checking to see if I could get away with it and I didn't. So there you go, Demo, get, Demo God's got some blood. And as we wait, three, two, one. Wait, zero destroyed? No. All right, so I'm gonna delete manually here because I don't wanna go through importing because it's multiple systems. And you can imagine this is where it gets a little disgusting. No, that was a great time to do that. I screwed up. Okay, well, anyway, let's do a Terraform apply now. As you can see, I'm trying to be as messy as possible to see how well we can work here. Creating, so we got controller, we have one worker, and it's gonna go do its thing. While that's going off, oh. yeah, I hit control C again because I'm an idiot. Let's delete, delete, all right, one last time. All right, let's do a Terraform apply over here and a control, hit yes, control A, shift N. There we go. Sorry, I screwed up creating a new window in. And of course my screen state is stuck. There we go. All right, so from here, Ansible, let's get this entire thing deployed because I want to show you why it's nice, at least in terms of Kubernetes, to have that feature to add to a cluster when it's running, um, just to make sure that, uh, or to show you how Terraform can allow you to handle elastic computing, not through an auto scaler, but manually, very simply, obviously using Kubernetes because I have an addiction. By the way, it was at a uh, lug meeting in Ames where I met the first person and he was giving a talk that night um, who said that farming can be an addiction. 
and it, and then when he explained it, I totally got it. But until he explained how farming can be addicting, I did not get it. So farming, apparently, he needs an anti drug. I can't remember. Was... What? Oh. Who was it? Ask that question again. I missed it. It looks like Don may have crashed out. Uh, well, he was kind of expecting that. Anyway. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think his name was Mark something. I don't remember exactly too much. Remember, also, it was a long time ago. So is that the uh, days of uh, Fug it or uh, Ames Fug? And, uh, it was CIA Lug, uh, or Central Iowa. It was like North Ames, whatever. But it was not Fug it. It was after that, I guess, or I don't oh, know. It was uh, Ames Fug then, probably. Uh, it was, I think, 2007, 2005, 2007, 2008, actually. Maybe yeah, I believe that was the uh, Ames Free Unix group then at that point. No, that was after. Or sorry, this was after that. Oh, okay. Because um, the person in the Ames lab resigned from the NetBSD group or something. And Don, your audio is working now. Sorry about that. Um, so let me see here. I wanted to do, oh, that's right. I had to do this command, which was pip install upgrade CLI. Uh, Linode CLI is constantly updating, so let's go do that quick. Okay, cool. Now I can do the get Linodes, which over here will allow me to uh, K3s install. All right, so that'll install all of that. So I'm actually going to run from this folder. All right, so it's actually deploying Kubernetes in the background. Give it a second on nodes. This will change over in just a moment. Yeah, pretty much. All right, so we have two nodes working in Linode. Uh, let me quit out and actually go to a separate file for that. Let's run K9s over here. Also, it's time to start labeling things. So let's go into that file. And we're going to call this K9s. And this one we're going to call Terraform. OK, cool. So Terraform, OK, we have two nodes. I want three nodes. So how are we going to do that in Terraform? Well, we're just going to go back in that Arch Linode file. And notice I'm not going to rebuild the cluster. I'm just going to replace that with a two. You know, you know what? I'm greedy. It's going to be three. Terraform, you can do a plan but we're going to just go straight for the apply because I'm feeling lucky. And as you can see, if I control escape, go up, it's just going to give me two more nodes. So there's going to be one because there's only, so it's zero indexed. So we're going to get two more Linodes. Hit yes. And while that's working, I need to go update the inventory, which means I need to go over to the Okay, so yeah, we're gonna call this one. All right, cool. And if I run the get Linode, it's gonna go update the inventory, Ansible script, uh, uses Linode CLI, grabs variables. If you want to know how to turn Python or read uh, Terraform and with uh, Python to go do things. This script in uh, the Linode CLI will help you out with that a lot. Um, technically, 
uh, now that I know more about Terraform, I could probably go through the Terraform state file and just read everything I need to and generate that entire um, inventory just from the state file if I wish. So, all right, that's about done. So now for me, and I've updated the, uh, hold on, web skill, okay, cool. So for this, now that that's done, I can do the K3 install join. Uh, cancel out, something went wrong. Uh, it's a host file, give me a second. Uh, this is probably going to be muddy and disgusting, so. I have no idea what I'm doing. Just yoink. All right, cool. All right, so now we have, if we notice, all systems are getting, are there. Uh, if you know anything about Ansible, yellow means changes, uh, green means go. So it's going to continue setting up. And what's going to happen here is if we watch, it's going to add automatically brand new nodes. So Terraform without on a running cluster managed to help us get new nodes added without doing anything too crazy and not scrapping everything. So that is why I say Terraform is awesome. Manually scaling. Now I'm going to go do something I never tried before. So <clears throat> I can't say for science without doing it going to go in this file and see if I can nuke some systems in the process. So let's do vim arch linode and if I just set this counter back down to let's say one terraform apply I could have just figured out what's going to happen. Okay it will delete. Oh geez. This is what happens when you hit the scroll wheel and your own screen and you didn't hit the uh the copy function first. So control A escape. As you can see, there's only only deltas that's showing is it's going to destroy things. I can't even scroll up all the way. Now the fun part is that while this is going on, this won't tell you if it's gonna stop being ready. But 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 as we can see, there's only two systems over here now. And for that, I think we can call it for uh, the, the talk, because guess what? We've gone above and beyond my expectations and my script. And I have no idea what to go from there. So any questions, uh, any challenges? You can type in the chat. I don't, I can have the IRC open too, if you really need to. Yeah, that's one of the problems is there's way too many different ways to communicate. No, the answer is we need one more, just as long as it's not Slack. Uh, hence why the, the bridge exists. Although now that uh, I'm uh, working from home for the indefinite long-term future, uh, Slack is a little bit less important because IRC is rather heavily clamped down on by the uh, network nannies. No, it's not. Let me show you my trick. This is my IRC client. Notice it is in a browser. So what I do is this. I go to Glowing Bear, HTTPS, Glowing Bear. And as long as you have a TLS certificate and you have your port exposed, this is going home. If I'm home on the router and I'm in a regulated environment, SSH blocked, not happening. This, however, works perfectly fine. I hit go as my password, TLS encryption, everything is fine. This is using WeChat, and then you just gotta set up the relay port if you wanna know about WeChat. Or sorry, this is using uh, Glowing Bear, but WeChat helped me set up the relay port, so. And they have a very slick uh, phone relay for it as well. That works really great. So uh, WeChat Android. 
and they do a fantastic job of explaining it someplace on how to set it up. So, yeah, the whole story why we ended up with a Slack bridge is they, there was uh, some uh, brand new person, first time showing up to the lug. Oh, we need to be hip and cool, and we we need to have uh, this thing that all the kids are doing. And then they never made it to another meeting. I'm not surprised. But, hey, you know what? I've only seen the IRC numbers dwindle a bit. But everyone that used to be, I think, uh, Chris Tao's on here, right, Kenneth? Yeah. I, I think he's one of the few names I still see in, I think, on IRC. But I think he's migrated to uh, Slack. I don't remember. Yeah, there there has been a fairly steady uh, transfer, but then again, I don't normally see the number of people in IRC either. So, as hey, long as my uh, uh, crappy Node.js uh, doesn't crash out, uh, it, it works for the bridge, I guess. Yeah, I guess. But uh, I can say right now, if you're looking for a place to host the bot, Kubernetes. It's great. Um, let me clean up my toys over here quick. So now that we have that down, so I'm just going to do a Terraform destroy so I don't actually have to worry about um, paying for any more of that. And let's see here. And we'll take this one, go over to Buzzcrate. Oh, sorry. I got to go to, no, I want to go back here. Ansible was great. So, uh, by the way, uh, there's this thing called catch up for Kubernetes. Um, if you're comfortable with just a simple shell script that calls up Ansible, I do the same thing as uh, catch up, which is just to go grab the file that you need off of the Kubernetes cluster. And so that way you can use your nodes here. And I still have that other virtual env running. Um, so if I run K9s now, I have my ARM cluster in here, which I can also show as kubectl get nodes dash o wide. And also note that I think I'm using on all my cluster a Linux kernel that is higher than most people's desktops that are running Linux. So, yeah. All right, but let's go to namespace quick. But I have my Discord bot in here, and if you ever want a ghetto way of having a bunch of servers, oh, uh, K9s, which I'll admit, when Jason was uh, presenting that part during the talk for the Kubernetes talk for the, the lug, um, I had never used it before. I started using it. Yeah, he's right. Don't use anything else. Just use K9s, look it up, go with it. It's amazing. So anyway, I can do go to pods and press zero for all of them. So this is all the systems in here. But literally, if I press S, I, I get a shell in it. And I can look at my code. And I can edit it right on the fly and relaunch if I need to. And if you want to know how that's done, you can always go to the Buzzcrate project. And if you have questions on making a pipeline to make it nice and simple, if you guys want to talk about pipelines, I guess that could be a December talk because I really don't even need to write anything for it. It's kind of all there. But uh, I want to go to Buzzcrate projects, groups, Buzzcrate. And also, if you guys want anything that I could help out, uh, with an app. I'm working on trying to make things to IoT, but I have some few minute things. Um, if you want to do something and put on your resume, open source contribution, well, this is an open source project. And I have a rather neglected section in here called apps. But give me your app. I'll make you an admin on here. Go for it. Throw on your resume. Everyone could be happy. And one of them could be a, uh, a uh, bridging bot, if you want, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, Andrew. Yeah, so I, if anyone is interested in that, uh, I can send you the code that it's actually using right now. It's the, the simplest, stupidest uh, uh, Node.js that I stole off the internet. But it's open source, so it's not really stealing. 
That's horrible. All right, so how about this? Create a GitLab account, if you don't have one already. It already exists. Publish it, make it public, and then from there, we can, uh, on a month we don't have a topic, we can try to wrap yours up and make it a, get a pipeline running and deploy it on my cluster. Yeah, I believe it. it's running on one of those uh, really shady, like super cheap, uh, like one or two dollar a month uh, VM somewhere out on the internet. And uh, it's just running in Docker and just easy to pop back out. No, well, if it's already running in Docker, we can uh, rebuild it and I can show you this. But if you guys haven't played with pipelines in GitLab, they're phenomenal. Literally, I'm building an ARM and an AMD pipeline for, like, my Go Echo stuff. So, by the way, it's still up and running. Um, if you go to static serve ddns.net, ports 8002 is the book list. Port 8001, after the slash, just put whatever you want. Literally, whatever you want. And it will echo that right back. So, let's say you're working with this guy, Ron. You just go... You can just send him a link and go, dude, someone made a link that's terrible. Just go, just be like, no. Let's call it Duck Ron. Oh, look, Duck Ron. Look at that. Hey, whatever. Go have fun with it at my expense. But yeah, um, still up and running from when you guys were giving your, or when I gave the talk for you guys. Well, not running. I've scrapped it because I use that also for demonstrating deploying Kubernetes to bare metal. So I guess there's that. But yeah, pipelines are are pretty awesome, and it literally you can watch this create be created live. Where green is the stuff from the pipeline itself, and it will show back a manifest of whatever you want. Um, Andrew, for you specifically, I'm sure you use and abuse pipelines at work. Yes, in unholy ways. Uh, actually, I just got done. Uh because uh, there's a NuGet server that uh, is on premise and we can't get to it from the cloud, but the main uh, builder for our new uh, .NET uh, projects are in the cloud. So uh, definitely uh, pull down all the packages I need uh, on an on-premise machine and then declare them to be an artifact and push them uh, to the next stage. So here's what I did that's dirty and unholy. First of all, this is building a container and supporting multiple arch architecture. 10 minutes for the entire pipeline. And of that, the build and deploy and push the image was, oh, I gotta move that. Three minutes and 35 seconds, that was a long one. Oh wait, sorry. The ARM one was longer because I saturate my internet connection here. So I'm not sure where the artifacts are going to or why it's so slow, but our GitLab instance, I spent 12 minutes and most of it was pushing the uh, artifact to the cloud. Yeah. It's probably their shady setup. It was also a roughly 500 uh, meg uh, stack of files, uh, all the different dependencies of the project. So it was huge it actually ended up being faster to gzip it into a file and then push that and then decompress it in the next stage. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was pretty painful. But the, the bot I'm using, I need to port it over to my uh, GitLab repo, but uh, the, that's my mirror of it. Okay. Yeah, it works. And then yeah, uh, just a custom uh, config file. Yeah, uh, the other trick I was going to show you too, and if anyone is interested, just message it in chat, is um, I, I want to, I, I break all the rules when it comes to using my builds. Um, if you note, you're not, the only time you see Docker listed is up here. Other than that, you're not going to find Docker anywhere else in the file, like, Oh, sorry. I do a Docker login on every step, and this is an anchor for, oh, there we go. I do an anchor for every step, which is just referencing up here. But yeah, uh, it's using Builda, and uh, 
let's zoom in on that. Here you go. Uh, whoa, too far. Stop zooming. Okay, there we go. So yeah, and for you, Andrew, uh, yeah, see this line? From scratch. Yeah. I'm not even using a container. I'm literally throwing Arch Linux, which is the base, which my builders are running. I'm talking on one and the other one's sitting right next to me. Extreme close up. Yeah, it, it was that, uh, that pixel was huge. Let me tell you. Um, but yeah, so literally from scratch. So it is nothing. And the build times for this one are what? Uh, 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes for this, uh, for this one as well. Uh, this book demo. So, oh, that's with the, doing the pip install and everything. So this actually takes longer than the Go Echo one. Okay. And then Discord bot, let's go take a look at that quick. I'm sure everyone's wasted time staring at pipelines, but so your Discord bot took oh, 10 minutes as well. Okay, so it's about the same. Oh, because it's also Arch. So if I go to, let's go to Go Echo. It's got an extra build step. I'm trying to do anything I can to get the build times down. And I know if I do it in the cloud, it'll go faster because um, better connection to GitLab. Yeah, six yeah, minutes. That does make a big difference. Uh, I don't know what your internet connection speed is there. Well, here's the thing. Um, because the pipelines are pretty much on par with each other and each step has to be done. So both have to build first and then both will do the build, uh, we'll do the build for uh, in this one. And um, we'll build the Golang. So it's small executable, nothing major. Then it will build the image and then we'll deploy the image. The deploy image was that six minutes and this takes three minutes. So half of it's spent in the deployment stage. This one took longer, three minutes and 58 seconds. Whereas the actual build step took what, 12 seconds? Oh, speaking yeah. of uh, uh, Docker uh, news, I don't know if anyone saw the uh, impending uh, Docker hub again that's uh, coming with their uh, free limits. Yes, I was messaged because I have things on there and I really don't care. Oh wait, you said limits or you mean the fact that if it hasn't been touched within six months, they're gonna automatically scrap it? So that, that part isn't the, the huge concern. It's more the, the fact that I, I forget how, what the, the limitations are, but uh, they, especially in like, say your company's uh, build server or something like that, you're, you're likely going to end up getting throttled because I want to say it's like 200 uh, uh, pulls per uh, eight hours or something like that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Docker hub limit. Uh, let's see, limit. Yeah, it's uh, going to be uh, where is it? Well, that's rather ambiguous how they write that. Yeah, I, I'm trying to parse this out. I, I remember there was better documentation in it. But it seems like effective November 1st is when they're going to start doing Oh, wait. Oh, dark mode. Thank you. More websites need to have that. There's got to be a better. By the way, if anyone still has any like questions on uh, Terraform or wants to try have my or have me try to do something dumb, please let me know. Actually, let's go to.
Let's see if, uh, no, it wasn't that one. There we go. Uh, it's uh, 200 pulls uh, if you're authenticated per six hours on the free plan, if you're authenticated. Otherwise, it's 100 pulls per six hours uh, for anonymous users. Oof. So that, that's based on IP address limitations. Mm. So like, say, if your whole office is on a uh, the uh, bad end of a uh, uh, NAT, you're, you're going to have a bad time. Oh, dear. You know how us uh, developers like to check in early and often. Oh, and God help anyone who's got uh, their pipelines are running full tilt and, oh. Oh, that could be bad. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's going to probably cause some heartburn. Uh, GitLab does have some uh, apparently proxying and mitigations that they're planning on putting in place. Well, I haven't played with it because I had a problem with uh, a particular step, but um, what was it? If you need to make an intermediate registry that you want to run locally that you guys can purge quite often, uh, creating your own. It's not hard to set up a uh, registry, really. It is if you want to put a signed key on it. Yes, the, the moment you get beyond just having a basic one, it starts sucking. Yeah. Um, I think I have one someplace on this is uh, ignore that last improper slash. There we go. Um, yeah, I really recommend using a local registry for it. And there's a way with the Docker file. So it'll create the registry, make sure that you have an external like uh, persistent volume source with it. But um, Let's see here. Where did I put that? I think I did something where I had a container server. Make cert. I think this was it. Whoop. Oh, wait, that's actually inside the registry. So that's the file. Ugh. And let's see here. So registry other search. So oh, yep, there it is. There's no run command. So set no number. No problem, Hawken. All right. That script, uh, please do whatever you can to copy and paste that someplace because that is a basic registry that also sets up the persistent volume storage for where you want it. Yeah, so the good news is uh, since this is my uh, Zoom account, I'll actually have a record of uh, the chat. Well, now it's time for ASCII art. Um, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can dump it into a paste bin uh, and share it out oh, uh, geez, as well can... afterwards. Oh, no, you got, all right. So I'm not sure if you guys have used and abused it yet, but encrypt. By the way, this seems like more of the general. All right, later, Chris. Feel free to anyone else to unmute and talk. 